Very cool. I trust now it's at the end, almost the end of the conference. You're fully caffeinated, probably maybe a little hungover, smelling of smoke, and probably of lost wages, right? I appreciate you coming to the session. Uh, my name's Mark Diodati. I uh, work at Ping Identity in the CTO office. I've been there a couple years. Before that, I was research vice president at Gartner, where I focused on a number of different identity and access management initiatives, including the first, I'd say, real research into uh, the IAM services within AWS. And so uh, I've been covering this market a long time, and I'm grateful to have the opportunity to come speak here. With respect to the agenda, um, I'm going to talk about a couple things. Just to level set all of us, I mean, part of my goal with this presentation is to um, bring the IAM people into AWS and bring the AWS people into IAM, looking at the different ways that these things are done. So I'm going to, I'm going to go very briefly through some IAM constructs, then I'm going to do the same thing with some AWS IAM constructs. Now, I know you've seen a ton of this stuff already, so I'm not going to you know, beat a dead horse when it comes to all the capabilities within AWS. And then I'm going to be talking about two different kinds of cloud modalities with respect to AWS, to AWS and from AWS. And I'll give you some more examples of that as we proceed. And finally, I'll point a couple of use cases that I'm seeing what, that people are doing when they're integrating existing identity and access management systems into AWS. And, and then I'll make a few recommendations. So let's go quickly through some enterprise uh, external IAM style things. The first thing is I want to talk about this topology, this to and from the cloud business. Um, there's to the cloud, from the cloud, in the cloud. We'll focus on to the cloud and from the cloud. To the cloud being extending your existing IAM capabilities from on-premises into AWS to support applications in that space, to support users in that space. We're usually talking about employees, right, if we're going to the cloud. In contrast, there's from the cloud, and that is extending AWS IAM capabilities to provide IAM services for your environment, right? So uh, talking about different things like identity management as a service and other things. When we talk about the different components of cloud identity, there are generally two things that you'll see. The first is something called an identity bridge. It's, it's really simple gateway that sits on premises. Its job is to take identity 1.0 protocols, right? LDAP, Kerberos, maybe a little X509, although that might live outside your firewall too. Um, and it takes that and it makes it work in a 2.0 world, moving from those classic 1.0 protocols to things like REST and JSON for provisioning, security assertion markup language for uh, single sign-on authorization for browsers, OpenID Connect, ID tokens, and access tokens. Um, so most organizations have or will need this kind of capability. They're already using it today. In a lot of cases, that identity bridge is coupled with something called an IDAS, Identity management as a service. I remember uh, debating my uh, Gartner colleagues in 29 and 2010 about what we were going to call this market, and I was a proponent of IDAS. Uh, we won out uh, in that respect. We had one of my colleagues who wanted to call it IAMASS, and I, I was just not prepared to say IAMASS you know, on stage. So that's, I think, how it won. <laughs> So that's the market class for really providing identity and access management capabilities from the cloud. What's driving that? Well, um, SaaS has spoiled everybody. So when you look at traditional IAM deployments on premises, you spend millions of dollars, you buy lots of hardware, you buy software, you spend a lot of time configuring it, it's inflexible. Well, organizations are looking for IAM capabilities from the cloud, and you know, they're looking for the elasticity, the alignment of revenue and costs, et cetera. Um, it is frequently used with an identity bridge, but sometimes not. Sorry for the NASCAR slide here, right, all the graphics. I just want to touch upon a couple of IAM concepts as we move through this. Now, I'm not going to talk about SAML and OpenID Connect and OAuth because I've got some slides coming up on that. But just to level set what we're talking about when it comes to IAM, there's authenticating users, right? So we can authenticate them with passwords. We can authenticate them with one-time password devices that might be on your mobile device. That's OATH, right? Uh, Oath is something that AWS uses for its virtual MFA technology, also Google. So it, that's why you can use a Google Authenticator, for example, with AWS. There are two emerging things that are happening that are going to change authentication in the long term. The, I'll talk about adaptive authentication first. That's looking at things uh, the behind the scenes of a tr session or a transaction, like device identification, geolocation, 
Maybe a million dollar funds transfer from North Korea when all you do is pay bills on Monday through Friday, nine to five is a bad thing, right? That's permeating all of our identity systems because with the explosion of the different user constituencies out there, we need different ways to authenticate them. Um, there's also something called local mobile biometrics. You know, we've somehow suckered all our users into carrying this thing, right? It's a, it's a, bi it's a biometric device. It's got a camera, it's got a, it's got a touch sensor, it's got a screen, it's got a microphone. And how can we leverage that um, to be able to better authenticate our users? We also have something else that's happening with FIDO2. It's called U2F. It's more of a hardware-based authentication mechanism, but those are coming together. So provisioning, um, we'll talk about just a couple of things. There's SCIM, which is simple cloud identity management or system for cross-domain identity management now. Um, and that's using REST and JSON to try and find a standard way to provision users into systems. You know, with the exception of AWS and federated users, because of service level reasons, virtually everybody needs the ability to be able to provision users into a target system. Um, REST and JSON is emerging as the, the, uh, uh, the underlying architecture for those. So if you look at Azure AD, for example, it's using REST and JSON for a uh, uh, graph API. So some level setting on federation, because it's important when we start talking about integrating with IAM. You've got two components here, the federated identity provider. Its job is to authenticate users and issue a credential. We call it a SAML credential, security assertion markup language. It's digitally signed by a certificate. Um, and the goal is to give single sign-on access out to a SaaS application. Where we call that SaaS application a service provider. Its job is to take that SAML assertion, and typically it's going to transition to a local credential type. Uh, again, certificate-based uh, of the signature of that XML document called a SAML assertion. That's how it works. That's the default modality. We'll talk about how it fits with AWS coming up. OpenID Connect and OAuth, two relatively new standards. OAuth is the authorization standard. Uh, OpenID Connect is the layer on top of OAuth that was just recently ratified that provides the identity layer and the authentication layer. And there are typically three parties in a transaction like this. On the bottom, you've got a client uh, application, call it relying party, whatever you want to call it. On the left-hand side, you've got the resource server. Um, and the resource server's job is to grant access, to let people actually access the resources that it can control. In many cases, by the way, uh, a resource, an OAuth resource server is a reverse proxy server because all the applications might be behind it. That's the same with a federated service provider as well. And the up inside, you've got an open ID provider, which has uh, an authorization service capability. Essentially what happens is the client authenticates to the user uh, uh, on behalf of the user, and they get uh, a couple of tokens. The blue one is the ID token. That's the most important one for our discussion for AWS. But there's also an access token, too. The access token is OAuth specific. And it says, this user, I, on I, this client is authorized to access this set of resources on behalf of that user. And so the uh, access token's presented, and live voila, you've got access. We'll talk about what that means in the AWS world, too. I want to talk about the second hop in an OAuth transaction where let's say you've gone to one provider or one set of resource services, and you've got this ID token. The ID token is very much like a SAML assertion. It contains identity information, whereas the OAuth token should be used for authorization, although people store all kinds of stuff in OAuth. It's, a, it's an interesting space. Um, so what happens is you go and you've got the token from the first system. You go and you authenticate with that ID token to another OpenID provider. You get your access tokens and you access the resources uh, in there as well on the second resource server. This has meaning. I didn't drag you through the mud for this because it, it, this is a lot of how AWS functions with an ID token. And we'll see that coming up. Now that we've gone briefly and talked just a little bit of smattering of external IAM, let's take a look at AWS IAM. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. I'm going to talk about identity stores. I'm going to talk about users, uh, IAM users and federated users and their associated groups and roles. So the first uh, and best known is the IAM user store, right? And here is some set of attributes you can see. The path is a particularly interesting attribute that the IAM user has. You can use it to map hierarchy. By that I mean the path attribute might be, you know, pingidentity.com slash engineering slash mobile devices slash OAuth, right, to, to mimic an organizational hierarchy. As we talk about coming up in a minute, that's going to be really handy if you're going to do data synchronization to an on-premises directory store. There's also a couple of other attributes, of course. The ARN, which is the Amazon resource name that's immutable. That's, that's just the lifetime of the user. 
The login profile is pretty interesting, too. If you do a read on login profile, you just get the date that the, the last date of the password was set. Um, important if you're thinking about synchronizing passwords or using uh, uh, AWS as an IDAS capability. Now, you won't actually get a look at the password, but if you do a create uh, login profile or an update login profile, you can actually set the password. But from a read perspective, you just get the date when it was done. And then, of course, the beloved long-term access key and, and uh, key ID and secret access key. I'm going to call those long-term credentials for now. Um, those are not readable. Uh, the access key ID is. Um, so if you need that kind of access key, for example, for multi-factor authentication, you might have to create it first. The next one that uh, was introduced in October 21st, I'm really excited about this. This is Simple AD, right? Some really cool capability. It's built on Samba. It enables you to join workspaces and EC2 instances. And if you've got AWS applications that can consume identity services from Windows AD, here you go. So you can manage users across these platforms. You can apply Windows group policy to them. You can authenticate users. And furthermore, you can actually use native Active Directory tool sets like ADUC, Active Directory Users and Computers. I mean, it's quite a tool set. Um, the thing to recognize is that users within Simple AD are not within the IAM store. They are not known users within IAM, although you can federate access into IAM for these particular users. Uh, very cool stuff. We'll talk about this as part of a strategy to maybe use a AWS as an IDAS system for your on-prem world. The third one really isn't an identity store. It's AD Connector. I mention it here for the sake of completeness. The ability to use your on-premises AD environment uh, to be able to authenticate users in things like workspaces and EC2. Um, you obviously need to use a VPN or direct connect capabilities to do this. Very cool capabilities. Um, you can see there's just a startling amount of growth that's happened with respect to AWS and the adoption of external identity things. It started a year ago with SAML SP support within the console, and then just a month ago it was OpenID Connect and OAuth. Um, we can talk, it's out of scope because I don't have enough time, but you can talk about Cognito, which has some OpenID Connect provider capabilities too. Just really exciting things happening so quickly in the world of IAM and AWS. It's just been really interesting to watch. So let's talk about, we've talked about identity stores, let's talk about users now. For me, conceptually, it's really helpful to think about the difference between federated users and IAM users based on how they access things, right? An IAM user is known to the, I, the AWS IAM system. You can do access certification against it. It's a known user, it's in the system. And an IAM user can use passwords or MFA at the console, right? So this is the console focus. Well, what happens at the API level, right? Typically, we all use long-term access keys. Um, but there are other ways to do this, too. You can use long-term access keys to get short-term access keys. Maybe you want to do that to scope down the level of uh, privilege that the account has for that session, limit the amount of time that the user has that privilege. And you can use multi-factor authentication in, in addition to that to set up the secret uh, access key. For the purposes of the presentation, because I'll run out of breath saying secret access key ID and long-term secret access keys, I'm just going to say long-term credentials and short-term credentials. OK, that's the shorthand. Let's look at the federated user a little bit. The good old ways of giving federated access into the console was a little tricky. Um, you would do whatever authentication mechanisms you did. A lot of people did Kerberos and LDAP kind of stuff. Uh, and then you would use an, an IAM user to procure short-term credentials. And then you would do a hell of a lot of URL rewriting to make a console thing work. I mean, thank goodness, um, if that works for you, great. We don't have to do that anymore. We can use whatever authentication mechanisms our, our federation product support, and we'll get a SAML assertion, a security search and markup language assertion, and go straight in. The federated SP capability is built into the console, so we don't have to go after uh, short-term credentials. For uh, API access, it's a, you know, it's, I think we all know this. I'm not going to beat my head on this. You just you externally, authenticate externally. You get some short-term creds. But now you can also use OpenID Connect to grab an OpenID token and then grab short-term creds. I'm going to walk you through that. Here's the classic model of delegated access. I know you've seen this probably for two days straight. But it's important because we're going to point out the core differences in security between this method and, say, something like federated IDP or, uh, or uh, OpenID Connect. You, know, you built the portal, probably, and you authenticated a user against Windows Active Directory. You've got an IAM user with long-term credentials sitting there stored somewhere. 
You either restore, uh, you retrieve a policy fragment or a role, or you call list roles to try and figure out what's available. And then the, uh, the IM user uses its long-term credentials to grab short-term credentials on behalf of the federated user, which they can, you know, for example, do queries on DynamoDB. Right? That's the way that works. Um, you know, you're storing credentials. Um, you have to worry about the privilege level of the, uh, the IAM user, too. It's, it's, a little, it's a little challenging to pull this off, plus you're writing your own to do it, right? All right, now that we've gone through all of this different stuff, talking about uh, external IAM and the capabilities within AWS IAM, let's take a look at these two particular modalities. We're going to look at two AWS now. How can I extend my existing enterprise services to provide access for my employees, to, um, to support the applications that are running in AWS. We'll walk through these five specific use cases. I'll talk about SAML, um, and maybe something you haven't seen before, using SAML to access the API directly without a browser. We'll talk about OpenID Connect, and then we'll talk about using external multi-factor authentication systems to access AWS. Um, AWS has a great system of virtual multi-factor authentication. If you love it and you're within that ecosystem, it's great. But what if you already have an authentication system? Uh, what if you're, you, you're authenticating to many other things besides AWS? How would you actually integrate those kinds of systems into AWS? And then finally, we'll es explore this idea of using the authoritative on-premises directory of users to sync those users into AWS. Why would we want to do that? Because we want to extend our existing identity management capabilities without reinventing the wheel. So when users are added, deleted, or modified in the enterprise, that change is reflected within AWS. You have a consistent set of policies. You can do governance better, right? Let's look at the first one. This should be pretty similar to what we saw before. Users authenticating using 1.0 protocols, LDAP retrieving user attributes about it. And at that point, what happens is the federated IDP is going to issue a credential, a SAML credential. You'll note here there's no long-term credentials being stored here. There's no IAM user. We simply have a federated IDP that's been defined within AWS uh, and an X509 certificate that's been bound to that specific IDP within AWS. So it's all about the certificate. There are some interesting things when you're doing SAML into the console uh, that you have to think about. You need three specific attributes to pull it off, right? And this, if you're familiar with the AWS IAM stuff, this is, this is crystal clear, right? Uh, of course, you're gonna need the SAML subject name. That's, not, that's nothing specific. But you're gonna need the role of what you want the user to have access to. You're gonna have to know the principal ARN of the federated identity provider where the certificate is bound. And then you'll pass something called a role session name. Role session name is uh, you know, uh, like MD Adati, for example, that I wanna pass in into the SAML assertion to tell AWS that, look, you know, as I do stuff, the audit log should say MD Adati. Or if I'm building wildcard access policies, for example, for S3 buckets, trying to mimic home directories, I can build wildcard access policies based upon that. Um, that's, that's really it in a nutshell. Very easy to set, set up. And you can see here the connection between the federated capabilities using these, these three attributes to get into uh, AWS. No short-term access keys being done here. That's all handled within the console. It's got federated SP capability. One of the things that we see a number of our customers doing is they really love SAML, right? We're Ping Identity after all, so we, we have a few products that do this stuff. And they like the idea of using SAML even in a native application without a browser. And it's certainly possible where you authenticate, the application authenticates, uh, the federated IDP will do its usual business, it'll grab all the attributes it needs to know about the user, and then it passes the attribute and uh, the assertion down to the mobile device of, into the native app. So now the app itself is holding the SAML credential. Now you can do this a couple ways. You can mimic a browser transaction, or in some cases your federated IDP will enable you to just make an API call and grab it directly. Once you have the SAML assertion, you just call assume role with SAML, right? And then you pass in the SAML assertion, the ARN that you, uh, of the uh, role that you want, and the principal IDP, and you're on your way. You get a set of short-term credentials on your end. So a variation on using SAML, but not for browser-based stuff, but for uh, access to um, uh, from a, a, a native API. That's not going to fly for everybody. And certainly, you know, longer term, you want to start looking at things like OpenID Connect, where you have OpenID providers authenticating users and determining access rights. It could be Google, Facebook. It could be your own. Again, I, think, I know you've seen a lot of this. I won't beat it to death. But here you have a, a client authenticating on behalf of the user. 
you're going to grab an ID token, right? You present the ID token to uh, STS with assume world with web identity. Really straightforward. You get your short-term creds, and then you're right into to, uh, the application. So here, um, there are, you might want to take a look at some of the stuff that Cognito is doing in terms of limiting exposure of keys, but this is a classic implementation without using Cognito and, and going through that specific uh, modality. It's a standards-based approach. Well, what about multi-factor authentication? Again, you may be in an environment where you already have a multi-factor authentication solution in place. You don't want to distribute another credential. Um, it's exceedingly common to see uh, uh, either open ID providers or federated IDPs have a built-in authentication capability to them, or they call off to an, an external authentication provider, something like RSA Secure ID or Symantec VIP or other things. And so here you've got a user coming in from whatever device they might be using. They do a, a one-time password authentication to the multi-factor authentication system slash federation slash open ID provider system. At that point, they get either an ID token or the assertion, depending on how you want to roll with this, right? And if you're going to use the ID token, you're going to do that and call again, assume roll with web identity. You give it the ID token, you'll get a short-term credentials. Or if you want to go the SAML route, great, too. Assume roll, assume roll with SAML, and you give the SAML assertion, you get your short-term creds, and you're on your way. Um, a lot of questions about this in the field when we, we talk to people about how they want to integrate the stuff that they have to access AWS. Finally, the last section I'm going to talk about is how can we extend our existing IAM capabilities to manage users within AWS, within IAM users? And you can use a variety of mechanisms to do this. These are, this is stuff that's happening today outside, uh, you know, in products and everything else, where you could use a sync service you wrote your own, you could use an identity bridge that has a sync service capability, or you could use a provisioning tool to do it. Here I don't show the underlying data store. It might be HR, it might be HR and AD coming together. But you would use these to synchronize the identities inside IAM. And you do it by monitoring the target directory. Let's call it the LDAP or Active Directory. Um, does that look like iChart to you guys a little bit? I'll walk you through it. Um, essentially, this is an overview of how you would do this. So um, at periodically, you would run the synchronization. You would get all your AWS users, typically using list users, right? It'll give you everything you need. And then for each of those users, you actually call um, get login profile, to determine if the password's been changed, uh, list access keys to determine if you need to create long-term credentials for the user, and then maybe long-term uh, uh, virtual MFA. Now, if you're not using all of those, I'm covering all of the, the, the bases here. If you're not, you wouldn't do it for everything, if just so what credentials you need. Um, and then you would actually take the AWS path of that user, map it out to the base distinguished name in a directory. It's very handy for doing that. Now you have the ability to search your on-premises directory, and you'll do a, a, a reconciliation. So you'll get three buckets of users as you compare your AWS users and your on-prem users. You'll have users that exist on-prem but not in AWS. That's your ad bucket. You have users that exist in AWS but not on your on-prem directory, that's a delete, right? And then you have modifies where they both exist and you have to kind of figure out what to do. By the way, as we go through these examples, in terms of pushing identities around, credentials is the hardest aspect of all of this. And because who's authoritative for it? Sometimes you can't read them, um, so you run into some challenges, but I'll show you how to do that. So for the add, really simple stuff, right? You create user, call create user command. You create login profile to set the user's password. Uh, if you're doing long-term access keys, create access keys. Now you're gonna have to find a way to distribute those long-term credentials to your users. Remember, you're on the on-prem side. You have long-term credentials. You've just created them. How do you get them to your user? The alternative is you could, you could loosen up your IAM policies within AWS and let the users procure their own long-term credentials too. Same thing with uh, a virtual MFA. If you're doing it, you do a create uh, virtual MFA, and you also do have to do an enable as well. And what you get back is the seed, which is a long-term, a very, uh, sorry, a long symmetric key that's used to calculate one-time password devices, or you have enough information to, to hydrate and create a QR code. But one way or the other, you're gonna have to figure out how to grab that information uh, and distribute it to the user. Your alternative, again, is you can simply uh, loosen your policies within IAM and let the user manage those themselves. Then you got to do group membership. Now, I included here within the diagram of adding a specific user identity, but many synchronization systems today don't do it that way. They may actually sync all the user information and then periodically sync group membership separately. Either way, 
Uh, you've got to take care of it. And then you're going to store some information like the user ARN. You're going to store the access key ID because you're going to want to know about that for modifies. Same thing with the logon profile create uh, date. So how holds the password. So know how to, to synchronize it. And then the serial number. And then you're done. Not too bad, right? Obviously, deletes are a little easier, <laughs> right? It's a single function called delete user. AWS takes care of the rest for you. So that you would use this when you have users in AWS but not in your authoritative on-premises identity store. With modify, it gets a little challenging too, but definitely achievable. The first thing you have to do is you have to hash the attributes of the users on both sides. So you take your AWS user attributes, you take your on-premises directory attributes, uh, and then you create a one-time hash and you compare them. And if they are the same, you're all done. That means that none of the attributes have changed. There's no need to do a modification. So you're off on the right-hand side. If not, you've got to go through and figure out which attributes have changed. The good news is that for the AWS IAM store has, it has relatively few attributes to worry about. So go in and do your update user. You might do uh, a password reset if it, it looks like the date is old on the login, login profile uh, date. You can do, do your business again of creating access keys if they're needed in virtual MFAs. And then you do your group membership, and you're done. Readily achievable today, right? This is stuff that I have seen in the field. Now let's move kind of into a different area. We talked about extending to AWS. But if you take a look at the world around you, SaaS has made material changes in the way that organizations want to do things. That's why we're all sitting here, right? IAM is no exception. And if you look at things like Azure, it has Azure Active Directory. It has from the cloud IDAS capabilities. It's just a question of time before people are going to start asking questions around, how can I do this within AWS? Um, and there's already a great degree of interest in this. And um, this isn't to say that this is how AWS was designed to work. Um, I'm not speaking on behalf of AWS product management in this way. I'm pointing out a way that you can actually do this stuff. And I suspect over time, I speak for me as a 25-year veteran in the, in the identity industry, I'm expecting to see changes where AWS opens up and becomes more of a full-fledged IDAS, my opinion only, OK? Three things. Synchronizing identities from the IAM store into your on-prem environment. Since we've put so much effort to put you, our applications in the cloud, and we were managing so many things in the cloud, how about we manage our users in the cloud from AWS, right? Um, and then we'll talk about syncing identities from simple AD into an on-premises directory environment so that you can use it for authorization and authentication. And then finally, we'll take a look at some examples of what we're seeing in the field now already of using federated SSO components, third-party ones, not ones that, that uh, AWS provides, in conjunction with EC2. We see an awful lot of that. But now with simple AD, you may have to not have to actually install a directory service to make your federation work. Really exciting stuff, right? Let's take a look at the first one. Here we have what we want to do. We want to actually sync user identities from the IAM store into your on-premises environment. So if that means we have to take a look at things like user attributes, and because the only real way that you can do authentication, and I'll explain this in more detail, is with multi-factor authentication and long-term access credentials, you need to be able to have those and store them in the directory too. Um, so we're talking about as you run the sync service, it will detect changes in AWS and it will replicate those changes into your on-prem environment, enabling you to use AWS as an IDAS for your on-prem applications. So this is what's happening in admin time. We're running the synchronization service. We're making updates as needed. Well, how do we actually do something at runtime? Here's an example of a runtime example, where you have, on the right-hand side, you've got a user, and they're, they're, they're going to use an uh, AWS virtual MFA credential, right? We want to use it for access to on-prem resources, though. And we have a WAM system in the middle, a web access management system. That's a system that does SSO on-premises on uh, with uh, cookies, HTTP cookies, typically. You could uh, take a, put a federation system in its place here, which in can turn authenticate the user and issue more standards based, whatever it, you might need to be. So the first step is that the user goes and authenticates, right? It provides a token code. It provides a token code that it sees. And then the WAM system does something. It makes an LDAP call, and it retrieves a set of long-term access credentials on behalf of that user. Now, the access, user can have many uh, long-term access credentials. They need not know about this specific set of access credentials. 
we, t we take it and we put it down in the directory because if you want to do something like a get session token call with MFA, you need to use the long-term credentials of the IAM user plus the token code, right? So the user's given us a token code. We've retrieved the long-term credentials with a token uh, serial number, and we can make the get session token call from the WAM system directly into AWS. Um, there may be ways, because AWS supports a standard called Oath for one-time password for uh, the credentials themselves and for the protocol, you know, there may be ways that you could even grab the, uh, the seed uh, or the uh, QR code, and you could actually store them in an on-premises authentication service, but I've kept it simple here. So at this point, you've authenticated a user, and what do we really care about guest session token? Are we gonna use that token at all? The answer is no. We just simply need a way to validate the, uh, the token code. Um, so set it for you know, limited privilege and a short lifespan. It's not something you're gonna use. Once the WAM system's happy that you've authenticated, then it's gonna do the usual WAM stuff or federation stuff where it'll, in fact it'll go and it will retrieve attributes, group membership, attributes about the user that it knows about, uh, and then it's gonna make access decisions. So let's walk how through you might actually create such a service. So, Similar to syncing to AWS, if you want to use AWS as an IDAS, you do a couple things for, at, uh, for as an overview. You're going to get your AWS users using those uh, API calls I mentioned. You're going to take the path of those users and rehydrate that to a, a base distinguished name for your users in the directory. At that point, you can do an LDAP search for all the users in your directory. You do the reconciliation. You have a bucket of add users, a bucket of delete users, a bucket of modify users, and then you're on your way. The difference here is that we're using IAM as an IDAS to push authoritative changes into an on-premises environment. Taking a look at the add, uh, create access key. You're saying to yourself, why am I creating an access key? I'm trying to be, have AWS be authoritative for the information. Um, but the reality is you can't read access keys through the API, long-term access keys. So you have to create them if they don't exist. So you create uh, the access keys long-term credentials. Um, you'll do your listing of MFA devices to get serial numbers if you're going to use those credentials. Um, you're going to have to do some interesting things around looking up attributes or creating attributes. Let me give you an example. AWS IAM does not store email addresses in, in the IAM store. So you could probably use some regular expression stuff. If my username is mdadati, right, I can probably recreate the email address by saying mdadati at pingidentity.com, right? But there are some things like common name, first name, last name. If they're important to you, you're either going to have to look them up somewhere uh, or, or create them on the fly. Um, when you've done all of that, then you can do the LDAP user, create LDAP user using LDAP add, uh, and then modify group memberships using uh, LDAP modify, right? Of course, the delete world is a lot simpler. Here, you just simply delete the user in LDAP, right? If the user exists in LDAP but does not exist in AWS, Unless you're going through a more elegant inactivation kind of thing with your end users, that's a signification of a, of a delete, and simply you just call LDAP delete, right, on your directory and you're on your way. Modifies, um, you gotta do that hashing thing again of looking at the attributes on both sides, detecting changes. If none of the user attributes have changed, you're done, right? If things have changed, you actually have to go through and repopulate them. If your access key ID is gone, it's been blown away for some reason, you have to recreate it. You need those long-term credentials, a set of long-term credentials to facilitate the virtual multi-factor authentication that you wanna do. And of course, you'll do your, add, you'll do your LDAP modify in the directory, um, and then you'll use LDAP modify to modify group memberships because you can, as those users are assigned to groups within AWS, you can mirror that authorization capability on premises. So what about syncing from the IAM store? There are some things that are possible today, some things that are not. Um, you can readily syn synchronize these things. As I said, you might, because there aren't that many attributes about an IAM user, you may have to do a look aside for things like common name, first name, last name. You might have to do some regular expression work to create an email address if you need it. You may not need that for the kind of, if it's an authentication style directory, those things may not be important for you at all. Um, authorization is definitely possible in this case. So you can use and manage IAM users in IAM and assign them to groups. You can synchronize those group memberships and have security applications on premises consume group membership and make authorization decisions. So authorization is certainly possible using uh, IAM as, a, uh, as an IDAS. The only way you can really authenticate users is with uh, 
is with multi-factor. There's no way to, you know, within the API to actually make a password call, right, to get session token. So long-term credentials are required, um, and then you're gonna need uh, the multi-factor authentication to do it. Now, your applications on premises, um, you can either modify them, for example, your WAM system, a custom auth scheme within SiteMinder, for example, or you can take your federated systems, which have very extensible authentication frameworks, and you can train it to do the authentication of the MFA against the user in the cloud. So that's the first one, using IAM Store. How about thinking about simple AD as a way to do IDAS management? It's a really exciting and new capability within, within uh, AWS. Now, again, these users are not in the IAM Store. You can give them access to aws -E things, but you've got to federate them. But for our purposes, if you want to use them as, uh, if you want to use simple AD as your authoritative identity management as a service application, how can you pull it together? First of all, you've got the trust relationship here. It could be, it's EC2. Uh, and what happens is you run a synchronization service or you buy one. You can go today and buy a sync server that will do this for you. you install with an EC2 and it, uh, it, it will sync your users from a simple AD into the on-premises environment. Remember, simple AD allows the management of users using things like ADUC. If you can do those kinds of things, you can imp implement one of these synchronization services. Go buy one today off the shelf and run it. The thing you don't get with this is the user's password. So you can sync everything down and use simple AD as authoritative for your on-premises apps, but you're not gonna be able to grab the user's password. Um, why? Passwords are kind of protected credentials, we know that. But in this specific instance, you know, in the old days, if we wanted to do password capturing on-premises, we could go and we could practice the dark arts of the Sith and we could go and we could put a password filter on the domain controller and we could capture the password, right? And we can sync it, right? Um, you don't have access to the simple AD domain controller. You can't sit there and put pass filter on it, for example. So you're not gonna be able to get the password. So you can do authorization this way and you can also do authentication, but you're just gonna have to figure out a way to set the user's password or if you're using native smart cards within your uh, active directory on-premises environment, you can do it that way too. So you get authorization, but you don't get authentication this way. By the way, I've hidden, uh, there's a number of hidden slides within the deck where a lot, of, a lot of intense graphic stuff, I've got slides that talk through them in detail. So if you're, you know, if you're done drinking from the fire hose and you're at home and you're looking at my prezo, you'll see the notes for them. Let's take a look at uh, using AWS as an IDAS for maybe things like federated single sign-on or OpenID Connect, right? In this case, we, you could do this before simple AD, but you had to install a directory service or you, had, you needed to log a social login provider, maybe you're using Facebook or Google or whatever that way. But there, with all these systems where you wanna do single sign-on and federation, you need access to the user identity to pull it off. So in the good old days, what we see customers do, they would install the directory and whatever kind of federation component they want. They'd run it in EC2, it'd be elastic, it's highly available, all that stuff that they love about it. Well now with the simple AD, we, we can worry a little bit less about that. You can authenticate users using a federated IDP that you install. It's a third-party thing, right? Um, and then you, the federated IDP will authenticate against the simple AD user store. Really handy, right? Um, particularly as you're not worried about uh, replication of uh, directories across EC2 instances, right? Really cool stuff that simple AD can do. Once the user is authenticated, just like we know before, uh, they get SAML assertions and they're on their way to either on-premises or SaaS apps. You can fill this in and do OpenID Connect with this by installing an OpenID provider in this space. So those of you who are familiar with federation capabilities uh, and uh, swim lanes of federation, um, these diagrams are pretty simple, right? I'm not showing HTTP redirects. If I did, we'd all be squinting. Um, trust me, I know how the federation stuff works. It's kind of like if you work at Ping Identity, you get shot if you don't. Let's talk about some of the use cases I'm seeing. Where have we come so far? We have talked about existing outside of AWS IAM capabilities. We've talked about IAM capabilities within AWS. We talked about providing IAM services to AWS um, using authoritative things in the on-premises enterprise world. And we've talked about AWS as an IDAS, right, from the cloud. I wanna just point out here some use cases that we've seen in the field, um, some very prominent use cases, and they're kind of in descending order. Well, first of all, go look at the identity management market. Anybody who's running a cloud, I won't say anybody and everybody, but the vast majority of the people who are doing identity management as a service 
as a service, right, offering it, are doing it with an EC2, right? It's just because it just, it takes care of all of that thing with them, all the replication, scalability, whatever you need. The second thing we see a lot of, and we've seen it for years, is that people are within EC2 installing a federated IDP so that they can provide single sign-on to partners, consumers, maybe even their employees, right? And they'll have to have a directory service and to do that, that's the classic model. Now with simple AD, I think we're gonna see a little, few changes in that capability. The other thing we see, and I guess this would make sense to you, is we see federated service providers running in EC2. Remember, the federated service provider's job is to take SAML credentials, validate them, and then issue a local credential type that an application can consume. So we have a lot of customers that are running federated SP and whatever application they happen to need access to with an EC2. And it just works, right? They can stand it up. Um, you don't necessarily need a directory services uh, environment in that case because all the attributes will be coming in through the SAML assertion. Finally, um, especially since uh, November of last year when uh, AWS introduced federated service provider capability uh, for uh, uh, SAML, we see now organizations that are saying, okay, this is great. I'm not doing this delegated access thing. I'm not managing IAM users and credentials and getting short-term creds. For employees that are accessing the console, they're doing SAML directly to it. So whatever the user can access through through the console, things like um, S3 buckets, for example, this is a very viable approach. Over time, you'll see OpenID Connect get bigger support. There's a really natural affinity between AWS and OpenID Connect because AWS is, in many cases, so focused on API-driven things, and so is OpenID Connect. Um, also, we have uh, a number of organizations who are using virtual directory services with AWS to do interesting things. So they have a highly available, you know, big database. It's, uh, in this case, it's DynamoDB that they're running to do, a, bi a biofarm is doing it, um, where they're storing clinical data up there. And they have researchers whose identities are known in on-premises directory services. And what they do is through a virtual directory server, which can create a, a logical view of a user from many different data sources and make it exposable via LDAP or even REST calls to applications that need to consume it. We see them merging that, and then they can do authentication and authorization uh, on premises based on the clinical data and based on who they are. Um, so an interesting hybrid cloud kind of approach for this. I have a few recommendations for you. I think I've kind of peppered them through, but just to dot my I's and cross my T's. You know, if you're going to do synchronization uh, to AWS IAM, extend your identity management into um, AWS IAM so that you can, as you administer users on premises, they can, they can replicate those changes into the IAM store. You gotta do this credential thing, right? This is the hardest part of synchronization. So if it's long-term credentials, if it's distributing uh, either the seed or you know, rehydrating a QR code so that they can actually get an MFA system working, or even password synchronization, um, you're gonna be playing the credential management game. If those things aren't so important and it's about authorization to you, then this isn't really a big deal. Now, if you're thinking about using uh, AWS uh, as an IDAS from, and you wanna use the IAM store, or uh, even simple uh, AD, you're gonna be in the credential business again, so I guess I'm kind of repeating myself. Finally, consider using EC2 to host whatever kind of identity services you need that AWS doesn't provide today. I really believe over time, my opinion only, right, as uh, more expectations are placed on AWS IAM, um, in particular for, for competitive reasons from Azure AD and start, people start thinking about AWS that way, I believe you'll ultimately see, in my opinion only, you know, I'm not speaking for AWS, you'll see federated IDPs that'll be exposed, you'll see OpenID Connect providers that are exposed. But for now, consider using the best of what you got, installing those systems into EC2 and using them that way. Um, if you're not going to use uh, simple AD, you have to really think about directory services because you can't do identity management services for like runtime things like authentication and uh, SAML, SSO, or OpenID Connect without that directory being present. I, I consider you to look at simple AD uh, as well. You know, we're coming down to the wire. I've got less than a minute. I, I am going to be outside, but I think we have time for maybe one question. Do you have any questions? I don't blame you, it's like 5.15, you got another session, maybe, maybe not, maybe you're gonna figure out if you memorize that blackjack table and you're gonna get it right. 
I, I, I just want to say thanks to Jim Sharp and the AWS team for having me come in, and, and it's a, always a great conference, and thanks for listening. I'll be outside for questions. Thanks much.